Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this day and for our time of worship this morning, Lord. I pray that we would never um, take that for granted. God, and I pray that um, during the service this morning that you would just open up our hearts and that you would speak to us, Lord, and that we would be obedient to respond to your spirit moving. Lord, we love you and we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. Uh, thank you guys for leading us in, in worship. I, um, we, uh, we've been going through a series. Um, I got some things I want to say today, and uh, I want you to hear them. And I want you to hear it from the spirit that it's coming. Because we've been going through a series um, through the past few weeks, um, entitled From This Day Forward. It's based on a book by Craig and Amy Groeschel. Most of the outline has come from that book, just so you know that. Uh, some of the thoughts, uh, my wife and I have been going through this book, and it's changed, uh, it's changed us over the past couple of months. It's uh, changed our relationship. Um, it's gotten us stronger together. We have a good marriage. Uh, but over the last uh, month and a half, uh, and I'm not saying it, 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 this book is the answer. What I'm saying is it's the Holy Spirit's the answer, yes? And so um, <clears throat> here's the things we've been talking about. Um, the first thing we talked about was seeking God. Uh, the second thing we talked about was uh, fighting fair. Uh, the third thing we talked about, and specifically, and this is in marriage, in having fun. Uh, and this morning, uh, we're going to talk about staying pure. And then the next week, we're going to talk about never... Uh, never giving up. <clears throat> so, um, can you get me a, a bottle of water or something, please? I, we had our first track meet yesterday, and I s screamed at about 34 kids. And so, <clears throat> uh, if you've ever come to one of our track meets, you know what I'm talking about. So, um, coaches tell me all the time, they're like, we don't even have to see your, your tent. We know you're there because uh, we can hear you uh, all across the thing. <clears throat> so, this, this morning, what I, what I want to talk about is, 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 is the staying pure idea. And and here's what I want to here's what I want to say to all of us. So if you if you tune out here after a minute or two and, and and you say, well, this doesn't this doesn't relate to me or whatever the case may be, this is this is what I hope that maybe you'll walk away with because I, I'm worried about the church. I'm worried about the next generation of church, but I'm specifically worried right now about the church. Yes, and, and so I want to thank you. I want to say some things this morning that that that. I've had to really pray over, and, and I want to say things right. I don't want to say things just because it's what Brent feels, and, and I want to say things that are scriptural, and I, and I want you to be able to hear from the Lord this morning and not just me. And this doesn't matter where you're at. If you're in a relationship, if you're married, if, you're, uh, if your relationship's in trouble, if you are uh, single, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Because I think we're all going to walk away with, with, with something this morning. And so he, here's, the, here's the main idea that you'll get now, and then hopefully you'll walk away with when, when you leave, okay? And it's this, and it's just a thought. The church is not called to blend in. We are called to stand out. Okay? So let's say it again. The church is not called to blend in, the church is called to stand out. Amen? God, speak to our hearts this morning. Use me in however you feel. And, and God, I pray that uh, we'll walk away from here uh, different than when we came in. Hebrews 13, 4 says this. <clears throat> it says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Now, that's a pretty rough verse, Yes? But it says something to us. It says that marriage, God honors marriage. Yes? He, he thinks highly of this. Uh, if you've been to a wedding I've done, you know, we always start out with the same thing. The first, you know, things God created, he said it was good. And then when he created Adam and Eve, he said it was what? Very good. Yes? And so God honors this. But, but let, me, let me just say this to, to those that are single and those of you who may not ever want to get married or, or ever get married, whatever the case may be where you are. God wants purity in our lives. God wants purity in each and every one of us that we do. And listen, I, that's just the truth, yes? 
Because God wants us to stand out. But everything in this world is leading us just to blend in. I can tell you when I was traveling with the North American Mission Board for, for the years that I did, there were times I'd be in meetings all day and, I, and I, I would try to schedule like an early flight and then a late night flight so I didn't, didn't miss a lot uh, from being at home. I, I ended up missing more than I, than I wanted to, but, but I was on the road like four days a week and sometimes I was in a hotel and, and, and sometimes I would, I would fly on these planes and, and there used to be this thought in me that I used to just get as I would go because I was tired and I, was, I wanted to be home and all of these things and I would get on a plane and I would think to myself, please don't let the person sit down next to me that wants to talk, right? Because if you want to do some ministry and you want to tell some people about Jesus, on a plane's a pretty good place. But I was like, no, I just want to sit down and be quiet. And I'm telling you, here's what I really wanted. I wanted to blend in. I didn't want to stand out. And shame on me. Because that's the reality. God did not put you on this earth just to live for your needs and the only needs that you have and all of those things. He put you on this word, earth to serve Him. Yes? And sometimes that means putting my needs aside and looking for the needs of others. And in purity, if we're going to talk about purity in marriage, the things that we allow in our life, the things that we allow to come into our life. Listen, this world, if you're married in this place, hear me. The world wants you to fail. The enemy wants you to fail. And if you don't believe that, I feel sorry for you. Because the enemy said he came to do what? Kill, steal, and what? Destroy. And so every time that we let something in our life that's not pure, it's one step closer. I've told you the, st the stats. 50% of all marriages fail. If you've got a 50-50 shot of making it home today, but you're going to take some precautions and you're going to do some things to protect yourself from getting home. The stat is about the same in church. However, if you drop, if you do things, if you're active in your faith, the stat says that 38% of us would, would end up in divorce, not 50. That means we're doing something. We're active. We're, we're, we're believing. And that's, that number's still staggering to me, yes? The statistic says that if you as a couple pray together every day, your likelihood of divorce goes to 2%. But the reality is, are we willing to do anything to save our marriages? Are we willing to do anything to really just save our soul? Because in some instances, this is bigger than just, just our marriage, yeah? Yeah. You see, some of us, we've let so much junk into our life. We've let so much stuff into our life that we don't even recognize anything else. And when God's trying to do something in my life, I don't recognize it because I've let so much junk in my life that's filtering up that and it's getting gross. Yeah? And it's time to stop. God wants purity in our marriages. He wants purity in our lives. And we are called to live different. If you're here this morning and you're not a believer in Christ, some of this isn't going to apply to you. But if you're here this morning, it applies to you. But if you're here this morning and you're a believer in Christ, I want you to know I'm talking to you today. Because sometimes we leave this place and y'all say, you were talking to me this day. I, and I'll say, well, I didn't, I didn't know. And I, I, I know today, okay? Because here's the thing, I'm talking to myself too. Because I don't want to live a life that's impure. I don't want to live a life that dishonors God, yes? See, what we've done is we've said it's okay to compromise. We've said it's just okay. I mean, we'll let a little junk in our life. We'll let a little stuff in our life. And the example he uses in the, uses in the book is it's this. If your cat jumped on the table and had diarrhea and went on your plate, you wouldn't eat it, would you? I don't have a cat but I'm still not going to eat it, yeah? Because we let stuff in our life. 90%, those studied, 90% of people say adultery is wrong. Yet, adultery is on the rise. So if 90% of Americans say this is wrong, it's still on the rise. Let me, let me give you this stat from the University of California. Back in, uh, they did a study between 1998 and 2008. In just 10 years, the percentage of people committing adultery in our country doubled. It doubled, even though we're all saying it's 
wrong. And here's the reality. That statistic probably doesn't phase half of us in this room. Because we've become so immune to it. And, and listen, why? Why does that happen? Here, here are just a couple of reasons. One, we have more temptations than we do in the past. <clears throat> it's easier to get. It's easier to get pornography now. It's easier, listen, there are, are, are apps now that if you're on the road, you can just get to the hotel and you can click your app and you can set up a date and that person will come to you. You don't even have to go anywhere. And the temptations are out there and they're all around us. We were talking in our small group this morning just about the fact that it is everywhere. Yes? In 1972, how many of you have ever seen the, movie, the show I Love Lucy? Do you remember? In 1972, it was deemed inappropriate. They slept in separate beds. It was ridiculous, but they did. And it was because in 1972 it was inappropriate for a husband and wife to be in the same bed on TV. Now, I did the math. That's 50 years ago. I'm 51. And in 50 years, has that changed a little bit? Has it? And you say, Brent, you're just being old-fashioned. Brent, you don't understand the new... You, you, listen, I've been a student pastor for 30-some-odd years, and I've been a pastor now for a couple of years, and I am telling you, out of 187 marriages I've, 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 I've officiated, half of them have survived and half of them haven't. I, I can talk intelligently about this, yes? Because we're letting stuff into our lives, and the temptation is there. In 1970, listen to this, because, because people are getting married a little bit, a little bit later now. Uh, and basically, that's this the second reason that we're there's adultery, because we're, we're getting married later. And so we have more partners, and we have more, uh, we have more opportunities, and we, and, we, and we do those things. The average in 1970, the average age for a man to get married was 22 years old. And the average age for a woman to get married was 20.4. Now, I don't know where the point four came from, but there you go. The average age now for a female is 33, while males are 35. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with not getting married till later in life. I, I, listen, go see the world. I mean, dude, but, but there's nothing wrong with that. And I'm not indi- I don't want you to get from that that I'm indicating there is. My suggestion is this, is that now there's just a longer periods of time where we have more temptation, Yes. And so back then, when you just you got out of college, you went to college, you got married. Now it's just different, and so so that's kind of what's what's happening. Now here's the third reason, and I and I want to I want to stay here for for a minute. Here's the third reason. I believe that adultery is on the rise. Is this is a growing sense of entitlement. Now let let me say. We live in a world that is full of entitlement, yes? And, and, and listen, it's creeped into our churches, and it's creeped in everywhere. But see, here's what, what'll, what we'll say. As, as a husband, she's not meeting my needs, so I'm going to go find someone who will, yes? And this is prevalent all over. You hear this all over. Something doesn't work for me, so I'm just going to go somewhere else. Can I make a suggestion to you? That's happening in churches, yes? Because if somebody doesn't meet my need at First Baptist Satsuma, I'm going to go somewhere else, yes? And let me tell you something. Let me, let me tell you guys something, this. If we want this church to become everything that it's going to be, it's going to take you and it's going to take me doing it, yes? And here's the thing. It's real easy for you to go somewhere and blend in. Here, you got to stand out. Because here we need some leadership, yes? Here we need some people that are committed to the mission of First Baptist Satsuma to reach the city of Satsuma for Jesus Christ. That's what we need. And just because you don't feel like it this morning doesn't mean that you, doesn't mean that you don't need to be here. Is that too much? Here's what it is. We don't care. Here's the reality of entitlement. I don't care about anybody else. I just care about me. And I care about what I need in this moment. And I care about what I want in this morning, in this moment. 
And it has nothing to do with the greater picture, yes? And see, that's what happens. And we don't want to talk about it. I I spent time with a pastor the other day, and he was telling me about how great things are going at his church and how we're not trying to steal other sheep. And then he told me about all the people coming from another church that he's at. Like, yes, you are. If I'm right, there's 20% of people that, go, that live in Satsuma that go to church. That means that 80% of the people around us right now don't go anywhere. My concern is this. Do we care? I'm so, this entitlement thing, I'm so tired of it. Because you are not, if you're called to Satsuma, you are called to plug in. Yes? You are called to get involved. You are called to do something. And it's for the greater good. It's not just so you can come and sit and maybe I'll tell a funny story and maybe you'll go home feeling pretty good about yourself. This is not a self-help program. And my fear is that we're letting this entitlement come into every area of our life and it comes into our marriage because if she doesn't fulfill my needs, I'm going to go find it somewhere else. And you're not. You're just going to keep looking. Yeah? Have I crossed the line today? I don't know if I have. It's okay. No, listen. I, I I don't want you to... I don't want us to to blend in. I want us to stand out. Students, listen to me. Students, listen to me. Stand out. Stop with this nonsense that I'm just a teenager or I'm just a kid. I'm just I'm supposed to stop with that nonsense. If you're a follower of Christ, you are to stand out, not blend in. And it's so often that we just say, well, they're just kids. I got a verse right here that says this, 1 Timothy 4, 12. It's not on there, Wayne. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but you set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in what? Purity. We don't have to be just like everybody else. We don't. If you're in a dating relationship, I think I told you this last week, and you're sitting on the couch with Netflix on, don't take your shoes off. Because you can't get your pants off with your shoes on. It starts somewhere, folks. Yes? (laughs) That may have crossed the line. (laughs) Well, you never know. Maria's over in the nursery watching this message right now going, please, Lord, just calm him down. <laughs> she, she, I, here, let, me, let me say this, and, and I, I, need, I need y'all to hear my heart this morning because I'm not trying to tell you. I'm worried. You know what I do? Can, I just, and you do the same thing. I do the things that are important to me. So do you. Yeah? Students in this room, listen to me. This verse calls you out. And Paul is saying to a young man, hey, don't don't blend in. You stand out. You make a difference in those around you. Yes? And because you're young, he says, don't let that, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young. Even you. I'm a follower of Christ, and I'm not going to blend in anymore, because that's easy. Stay pure. And I'm not just talking about in a sexual manner. Listen, and the whole entitlement thing is, is when you, sex is a gift that's given to us, and it's a gift that we give someone else, yes? Yes? The way the world has described this is, the way the world has twisted this is, sex is just all about you. It's about you getting what you think you need in that moment. It's about you. It's not about the other person. I'm telling you, as someone who's been married for 27 years, it's a gift for someone else. Yes? And when we just think of it as by ourselves, it's just me, it's about me, it's what I want, it's what I need in this moment. 
That's not what God is calling us to do. He's calling us to outwardly be different, and he's calling us to inwardly be different. How do we do outward purity? I mean, how do we do this? It really starts in our behavior. Listen to this verse, Ephesians 5, 3. It says this. It says, But among you there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people. Proverbs 5, verse 7 and 8. Now, the book, this, this, this chapter is talking about adultery from, from beginning to about midsection. And he says this. It says, Now then, my sons, listen to me. Do not turn aside from what I say. Keep a path far from her. Do not go near the door of her house. Talking about adultery. He's talking to men and women. Don't even get near it. Don't even go close to it. Don't even let that little text. Don't do it. Don't even go near it. In the next verse, uh, 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 1 Corinthians 6, 18 through 20, he says this. He says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were Listen, you were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. That's all of us, yeah? Every one of us. And here's the thing, because I know some of you now are, are in your mind, you're getting defensive, and some of you now are, are, are thinking that, 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 that this is just old school thought, and this is just, he's from the 90s, I'm really from the 70s, but, but he, 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 he kind of came through ministry early in the 90s, and he, and he did, these, and, that, and it's just kind of an old school, he doesn't understand where we are. This was written 2,000 years ago. So it's not old school thought. It's just thought, yeah? I mean, he's saying back then, he's saying, look, you flee from this. You flee from sexual immorality. You get away from it as far as you can. And can we just be honest? Here's what we're doing in this world. We're cozying up to it, yes? As Christians, I can tell you that one of our largest denominations, when they have a conference in town, it's probably different now because, because pornography is on, on so many different things, but I can tell you that pornography, when this, when this convention comes to town, that pornography rates go up threefold. It's because we're cozying up to stuff. And instead of doing what the, the Bible says, what Paul's kind of encouraging here, he, he says you flee from it. Don't even get close to it. But we want to cozy up to it. We want to get as close as we can without going over. Because here's the reality again. Entitlement. I still want to feel good about myself. So if I get this close to it, but I don't quite step over here, I'm just going to tell you, you get this close to it, and it's going to be real easy to push you over. Yes? And it's time that we stop this. And it's time that we as a church, men and women both alike, we stop all this stuff. And we flee from it. Get as far away as you can. Because it's harmful, yes? Otherwise, why would God say it? There's something about it. Well, Brent, I mean, it's just, well, we just do that in the privacy of our home. Listen, what you do in private is more important than what you do in public, yes? Because you can put on a good show for me. And listen, I, I've worked with students over the years. I, I, like I said, I, I mean, y'all know that because I was pretty much here. But in both, all three places I've served ministry, at First Baptist Satsuma, at the church at Severn Run, with the uh, North American Mission Board, and then back here. I, I'm telling you, this happens all the time. And it's happened all the time. And I'm tired of it happening. Where, where, where people cozy up to this stuff, I, I can tell you in four instances where students I know called into ministry. God was doing some amazing things in their life. And I know that, I mean, I was there. I was a part of it. I, I saw it. And God's doing some amazing things in this person, this young man or this young woman's life. And then what happens? They get into a dating relationship. 
And then one thing leads to another. And they, they've, they've made a stand on what they're going to do for marriage. But one thing leads to another. And they find themselves in compromising situations. And they keep inching their way up. They're not fleeing from things. They're inching their way up. And before you know it, they've crossed some lines spiritually. They've crossed some lines that they feel guilt about. They've crossed some lines. And I'm telling you, in the four instances that I know that I can, I can point to, in the four instances, none of them are even involved in church anymore. And yet at one point in their life, God was doing some amazing things. And it's because of this. It's because we just get as close as we can. We don't flee. We cozy up. And long before we know it, we're not even involved. And if you're married in this room, I want to tell you the same thing happens in our, rela- in our marriage. Yes? Someone sends that text. We get a little closer. We start thinking, well, they, 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 they listen to me. My husband, my wife doesn't really listen to me. And we start inching our way closer and inching our way closer. And that's the way it starts. But my wife is a great gift of discernment. And there, there, have, been, there have been several instances in our life. This is going to sound terrible the way I'm about to say this. But, but way, I, I kind of, like, Maria's a realist, you know. And I'm like this optimist, hey, everybody's happy, everybody likes you, everybody wants to be your friend, right? And the problem is we're dealing with spiritual warfare, yes, and the enemy cheats, yes? And there have been several times my wife has said, you need to stay away from that person. You need to get away from that person. And she's been right. We can't cozy up, we can't cozy up to things. We've got to flee these things. And if you're here and you're looking at stuff that you know you shouldn't be, stop. Do something different. We had a, we had a student years ago that, that got hooked on pornography and things like that. And he came to the office and we talked about it and we, he shared about it. And then he kept coming to the office and saying, it's still a problem, it's still a problem, I still can't get away from it. And finally I said, you need to get rid of your computer. And that afternoon he came back and he brought me his computer and said, will you hang on to this for me? Well, we got to do something, yes? And it's time. It's time for us to stand out and not blend in. There's an outward behavior that we need to change. We need to realize in just lots of aspects of our life that we've got to change. The second thing is just there's an inward purity, and that, that deals with our heart. Um, Psalms 119, 9 through 11 says this. It says, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living, listen, how can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. The idea that we can't stand up because we're young, the idea that we can't do those, we can't because of the way our world is, we can't do those things, I would say that this verse proves that we can lie sometimes, yes? How can a young person stay in purity? How? By living according to your what? Word. And then he says, hide this in your heart that you may not sin. Because see, here's the reality, guys, and this is what I was talking about in a minute. A, a little while ago, I believe what this verse is talking about is this, is what we fill our heart with matters, yes? What we allow in matters. Anybody ever let your uh, air-conditioned filter go too long other than me? It's pretty gross when you pull it out, isn't it? You see, what we're filtering our life through and what we're, what we're allowing in, it, it's causing other things not to get in. And this verse, in my opinion, what he's saying is, look, you fill your heart with my word. You fill your heart with my words. And when these moments come up, you're going to recognize them. You're going to see them because you know what my word says. Here's the reality. that Are we encouraging that? Are we, in, are we doing home Bible stuff? Are you praying with your wife? Are you doing those things? I mean, what are we doing to get our kids to a point where they understand what God's word said? And here's the reality. I said we do things that are important to us. If it's not important to you, it's not going to be important to the next generation. Yes? How much is God's word important to you? Because he's saying this, hey, if you want to stay out on the path to purity, if you want to stay on that path, if you want to stay in the plan that I have, get into my word. Yes? 
We're raising a bunch of kids that are going to one day know a lot about softball and very little about God. Is that too much? I'm not trying to, listen, I'm not bashing the younger generation. We're just as guilty. But for us as men in this church, for us as women in this church, for us as students in this church, we are called to stand out, not to blend in, and it's time we recognize that, and we started living that way, yes? What we fill our heart with matters. You know, and this is the thing too. I I was told by somebody a long time ago, that a, a good friend that made a huge mistake. And as we were talking about their mistake, they looked at me and they said, well, you know, you can't help who you give your heart to. That's, that's a lie. Yeah? Don't give your heart to anybody that wants to abuse you. Don't give your heart to anybody because with that logic right there, then some of us are going to wind up in a, in, in a mess. Yes? We all in this room need to strive to be the right person. And I believe that's done by through following Christ. We've got to be careful. And you can control who you give your heart to. Don't get in that place before it's too late, yes? See, our heart is important. What we put in is important. What we allow in is important. Matthew 5, 28 through 30 says this. It says, but I tell you, anyone that looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with, with, with her in his heart. He says this, and, and I don't think he's being literal. I don't, I, don't think he's being in, I don't think he really means for us to go get a knife or whatever and gouge our eyes out or anything like that. But what I think he's trying to say is this is really, really serious. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than uh, for your whole body to be thrown in hell. He's saying this is serious, yes? And, and so here, here's my so what this morning. Because there's three ways that we're going to respond to this, okay? Because when I read it, and when I started working on this message several weeks ago, there were three ways I responded to it. And, and one is our, our propensity to, to get defensive and to say, well, you just don't understand. You're, you, you, know, you and your wife just, y'all sing hymns all the time and read the Bible and that's all y'all ever do. That's wrong. But, but we get defensive about things. And you say, well, he's not really, he's not really talking to me. And, and the thing is, is, you can get defensive about it. You can send me a text or an email or whatever and say, you're crossing the line. I mean, that's fine. But that's not going to change anything. I mean, we still got a problem, yes? But we can feel remorse. Secondly, we can feel remorse. Well, I'm sorry for what I've done. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I know it's wrong and I shouldn't do it. But I'm not going to make any changes in my life because I kind of like the way things are going. I kind of like who I am, and I, I'm not going to make any changes in my life. I, I, I recognize what you're trying to say, Brent. I really do. I get it. You've repeated yourself about 30 times. Can we move on? That's part of it, remorse. Or the third thing we can do is repent. And we can make a change in our life, yes? Because that's what God's calling us to. He's not calling us to justify our actions. He's not calling us to do those things. He is calling us to, uh, to, to repent. Throw, uh, throw that last verse up there. Yeah, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, uh, 10. It says this. It said, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leads to no regret. But word, worldly sorrow brings death. See, My last little notes here are this. It says this. It leaves no regret. Here's what I hope for for my life. I I, want to die, and I want to go to heaven, and I want to stand before Jesus, and I want Jesus to say, well well done, yes? I mean, if you're a follower of Christ, that's that's, that's what you want, yes? And and that's that's what I hope for. But while I'm here on earth, I I want my wife to look at me and be proud of the man that I am. I I want 
I want my kids, when, when I am gone, and I'm going to be cremated, so I'm going to be in an urn, and then I'm going to make some key change for the family. Maria's always losing her keys. I said, I want one that beeps, you know. <laughs> she can go, Brent, beep, 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 beep. Oh, Brent's over there. <laughs> I lose my keys too, but, you know. But I want my kids to say, man, he loved my mom. I want him to say that he followed Christ in a way that I want to follow Christ. I want you as people to say, you know, he loved Jesus, he loved his family, and he loved us. I don't want to live a life of regret. And I don't want to do things that cause regret in me. And he says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. I'm going to say this and I'm going to finish. <clears throat> what you do when nobody's looking matters. And what you do when you think nobody's looking matters, yes? And it matters to our core, to our soul. And I just say we do the things that are important to us. We sang a song, we're going to sing another one in a minute, but we sang a song that it said, the king of my heart is the wind in my sails. My question for all of us in this room this morning is this, who is the king of your heart? What is the king of your heart? Don't get defensive this morning. Don't just be remorseful. Let's do some repenting, yeah? And let's let God's spirit move in this place in a way that we didn't know possible. Let's let God do something in and through us in this town, in this community that we never thought possible. And it starts somewhere, yes? It starts with me and you deciding to follow Christ above anything else, putting my needs aside and looking, what does God want me to do? What is God calling me to do? And I don't know where you are spiritually. I don't know what goes on in closed doors. I don't. I don't. But if the statistics are right, there's some of us that are struggling. We need to repent from those things, and we need to make some changes, and we need to do something different. Yes? And it's time. I've been living with those regrets way too long. In just a second, we're going to pray, and we're going to close, and the altar's going to be open. You can come and kneel and pray and do whatever you want. Maybe some of you need to just grab your wife by the hand and say, look, we need to start praying together. I want to go down right now, and I want to pray with you. I want to pray over you. I know it's weird, but do it anyway. And maybe some of us in this room, we've just got some stuff going on that, that nobody knows about. Maybe you just need to repent of that. This altar, there is nothing magical that happens here, but there is something supernatural, yes? This is a special place where we can come, and I, I, I just I want us to open that up and just have some time that we can do that. Let's pray together, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get going. God, thank you for today, and thank you for all that you do. And <clears throat> Lord, I pray that... We will understand what, what following you means. And it means getting away from things. It means fleeing things. It means being different. Not to just blend in, but to stand out. So God, I pray that we'll be men and women, boys and girls that do that. I pray if there's, if there's, if there's folks in this room that just need to do something, just do something different. Let to give them the courage today to do that. Pray that your spirit will move in this place right now. We love you. It's in your son's name. If you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed, listen, and starting this all off, I, I said, if you're, if you're not a believer in here, you know, you can be. 
and the reality is, is that there, there, there are people in this room that need to come to that place where they understand who Jesus is in their life. And we believe here at First Baptist Church, we are not perfect. I make mistakes. Everybody in this room makes mistakes. We are not perfect, but we believe in a perfect God. And we believe in a God that loves and forgives and wants to give you a life that you never thought possible. And it starts with just a first step. And here we, we say this, it's a prayer, it's a simple prayer. And we say this together every week because we don't want anybody to say this alone. The prayer goes like this, and just, just repeat it after me. Dear Jesus, I believe that you died on a cross and that you rose again. I know I'm a sinner. I need forgiveness. I want to invite you into my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I want to start this journey with you. It's in your name I pray. Hey, if you said that prayer in just a second, I'll be down here. We can talk about it. If it's not, if you're not comfortable coming down and talking about it, uh, just text me, call me this week, and we'll get together. We got some information we'd love to give you. We don't want you to just make a decision, walk out, and never think about it again. Because we believe this is a beginning to a journey. And that God wants to take you on. He wants to go with you, and so do we. If you're here this morning and you just need to come down, kneel, and pray, let, let's do some business this morning. And let's allow God to move in this place. Not worried about what other people think. Not worried about what someone may say if I go forward. This has been a tough sermon, and people can make judge whatever. That's just entitlement again and being weak and minded. Let's do something this morning pray one more time and then we'll sing, we'll stand and, and uh, you do what you need to do. God move in our midst break our hearts where they need to be broken and put them back stronger and bigger and better than before it's in your son's name we pray